that in the darkest times of my life, God knows where I am. In the darkness of my depression, God knows where I am. In the darkness of my sickness, God knows where I am. In the darkness of that which breaks my heart, God knows where I am. Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Welcome to those of you watching online, joining us here right today and throughout the week as well. We want to welcome you and wish you a very Merry Christmas. Christmas Day, guys, is an opportune moment to invite people. So if there's someone in your family who's coming over for Christmas, why don't you just ask them? I know sometimes we feel a little bit awkward and say, oh, they may not want to, but you never know. They may decide to. So why don't you ask them? If there's friends you know, next door neighbors, and you think that they're on their own and they would love a good start to Christmas Day, why don't you invite them to church? What a great way to start Christmas Day. Okay, turn with me to your Bibles to, uh, there's a word from the Lord in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. There are Bibles in front of you if you want to follow, uh, or on your apps, on your phone, iPads, whatever you use, or, or a real Bible with the words already in a book. We are in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and we have here another visitation. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the visitations of angels, and today we see another visitation of an angel, uh, but this time to the shepherds. All right, before we get there, put your hand up if you've had a new baby in your family this past year. Anyone? Oh, gosh, there's a lot of you. Okay, who's become a new parent? New grandparent? Okay, any great-grandparents? Any great-great-grandparents? Oh, this is a really young service, isn't it? That's good. Well, perhaps you, well, you'll know this then. There's no more joyous occasion than a newborn baby. If you walk around any maternity ward, you'll see fathers and grandparents going totally gaga uh, because of this newborn baby. Oh, isn't he cute? Oh, chicka, 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 chicka. Absolutely gaga. You know it's a beautiful thing when a baby is born. And then we've got the task, and you suddenly realize we've got this next task of letting everybody else know who's not there uh, about the baby's arrival. So we want to announce that to friends and family. So what do we do? We take a selfie with the baby. We up- update our Facebook page. We put it on Insta. We might send a tweet to people and let them know uh, that the baby has been born so they can share in our good news. And the wonder of today's story is, is this is God's announcement of his son Jesus in Luke chapter 2. But he announces this only to shepherds. Why does God choose shepherds? Why uh, Why not the palace or why not the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the people who are important? Why waste the greatest news ever on shepherds? Well, let's pray as we dive into God's word for today. Let's say this prayer together. I believe this is God's word. It is alive and active. It is food for my soul and healing for my body. I am ready to receive the word from God today. In Jesus' name, amen. So why does God only announce the birth of his son to shepherds? Well, join me here in Luke chapter 2. Well, we start at verse 8. It says, look at verse 8. Now in the same region, there were shepherds, right? So like any proud dad, any proud dad, God the Father wants to announce to the world that his son has been born. This was the biggest event in human history. The biggest event. And the Lord decides that the only people who get the announcement are some sheep herders on the outskirts of Bethlehem. Why shepherds? Why shepherds? I don't know whether you've ever asked that question or even thought about it. Why only shepherds? Because if you, if, you, if you transport yourself back into the time when Jesus was born, shepherds were despised people. I mean, you, you couldn't come home from school with, and say, Mom and Dad, I've got my HSC, my ATA, and I've decided I'm going to be a shepherd. Your parents would be like, what? Have you lost your mind? Shepherds were outcasts. Shepherds weren't allowed to even give a testimonies, witnesses in court, because they were seen as untrustworthy. Shepherds are unclean. Shepherds live in a field with sheep, and they smell like sheep. I mean, if you had to rate yourself in terms of how popular you are out of 10, how would you rate yourself? 
I'd rate myself as a 10 because I'm humble, but you would probably rate yourself a little bit lower than that. But if the people of Bethlehem were rating shepherds, you went to somebody in Bethlehem at that time and said, what, what, you know, what, where would you rate a shepherd? They would be even struggling to give them a one. That's how bad shepherds were in that time. They were so despised. Nobody wanted to be with them. If you had a dinner party, shepherds were not on your list. So why does the Lord choose smelly shepherds that everybody else rejects to announce the birth of his son? Well, this is the great news. Two things. First of all, if the gospel required a high IQ, if you had to be a member of Mensa to be a son of God or a daughter of God, then those who are not intellectually gifted could never hope to qualify for salvation. But secondly, I would suggest to you that, that the Lord chooses shepherds to let them know and to let us know that the, this gift of Jesus Christ, this gift of his son, is not limited. That this gift of Jesus Christ is for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his son so that we would not perish but have eternal life through him. It was, this gift was for all people, every tribe, every nation, every age, every man, every woman, every student, every teacher, every criminal, every judge, every soldier, every terrorist, every preacher, every prostitute, every generous person, every greedy person, every Sydney Swans fans and even Broncos fans, every homeless person, every minimum age employee, every CEO, every church member, every atheist, every king, every shepherd. This gift that God had birthed into the world was for everyone and all people. Nobody was outside of his remit. So that's one piece of good news. That whoever you are, you are not outside of God's love. But notice this. Notice what time the Lord turns up. He turns up at night time. Were some of the shepherds asleep? We don't know. Were they sitting around the campfire telling stories? We don't know. Were they singing Kumbaya? We don't know. But we do know this, that God shows up in the darkness. And that's a word for somebody here today and for listening online, that the Lord shows up in the darkness. That he says, I know where you are. Everyone else may have dismissed you, but I see you. That in the darkest times of my life, God knows where I am. In the darkness of my depression, God knows where I am. In the darkness of my sickness, God knows where I am. In the darkness of that which breaks my heart, God knows where I am. But it gets gooder. He not only knows where I am, but he comes to where I am. That God identifies by his GPS where these shepherds are and sends the angel chorus right there to their location. He doesn't tell them to go somewhere first. He meets them where they are. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know whether you've ever thought about that in this story. He comes to where the people are. He meets them where they are. And just listen to where they are. Don't miss this. The Lord sends an announcement of the Son of God to a field filled with sheep. A field filled with sheep. Just think about that. A field filled with sheep is not just filled with sheep. I'm trying to keep it as holy as I can. But you know the sheep do their business all over the field. And the Bible doesn't say that the shepherds are working in the field. No, read your Bible. The Bible says they're living in the fields. This is not their workplace. It's not where, as Reverend Dolly Parton says, working nine to five, trying to make a living. This is where they live in a field filled with sheep and sheep droppings. And watch what happens in this field filled with sheep and sheep droppings. An angelic choir that's been rehearsing in the music room of heaven shows up in a field filled with sheep and sheep droppings to sing the praises of God. Verse 9 says, And the glory of the Lord shone around them. I don't know whether you've ever thought about that. That in the midst of this smelly, this messy situation, God decides right there, you know, right there where the sheep are, where the dirty shepherds are, where there's excrement all over the place, that's where I'm going to shine my glory. 
Now, this is terrifying. This is like, how can this be? Like, I can understand when God's glory is in the temple. I can understand if God's glory is in the church and shining around us. I can understand when God's glory is in nice places and pleasant places. But here's what leaves me scratching my head. In the middle of a messy field, in the middle of a messy situation, God lets his glory shine. That in spite of how wretched I am and how messy my life can be, God still shows up and shines his glory, even when I know that I'm not worthy of it. Some of you probably came to church today and you think you can't come to God because your life is too messed up. Well, hello. Welcome to the club. We're all a little bit messed up in church. But God shows up in messy places and in the lives of messed up people. Kesh, how does the glory of the Lord shine all around me? I'm glad you asked. It doesn't say that the glory shined on them. Don't miss that. It doesn't say the glory shined on them or through them. It says that the glory shone around them. Because when you find yourself in a messed up place, when you feel like God is nowhere to be found, that you stop looking in the mirror and stop feeling pitiful about yourself and look around and see God's glory shining. Think about the people who love you. Think about all that God has given to you. Think about all that God has done for you. I know you don't like your job, but it pays your bills every month. I know you don't like the house that you live in, but at least you're not living in a car. If you look around you, you will see the glory of the Lord shining around you, all around you, in the people that are around you, and the situations around you as well. But it gets gooder still, because in verse 10 and 11, the angel says, don't be afraid, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born a saviour. That phrase, to you, another way to translate this from the Greek, is for you. But the angel is saying, for you, a saviour has been born. God makes it personal between us. That Jesus was born for the shepherds. He was born for those who had nothing to their name. He was born for those who were lost. He was born for those who were at the bottom of society's ladder. He was born for those who struggle. He was born for those who hurt. He was born for those who were broken. He was born for those who were rejected. Jesus was born for us, for you. But the Lord says, I don't care how bad your life has been and what your past consists of. I came for you. I don't care how many people have ruled you out and have rejected you. I came for you. For you a saviour has been born who is Christ the Lord. There's a lot of in that verse, in that verse because first of all it says that he's a saviour. I mean, have you, have you ever asked the question, what do we need to be saved from? Why do we need a saviour? Well, that question is answered when the angel speaks to Mary and Joseph. Uh, the angel says, you shall call him Jesus, Yeshua. God saves, that's what it means. For he will save his people from their sins. We need to be saved from our sin. And God sent us a saviour. And secondly, the angel says, who is the Christ? And just so we're clear, for those of you listening online too, that Christ is not Jesus' surname. It's not two names like that. It's the title of the Messiah. That's what Christ means, Messiah. Messiah, Christos is the Greek. Christ is the English. Messiah, who is the chosen one, the one the scriptures foretold centuries ago, the deliverer that was long awaited for Israel. That is the Christ. And lastly, the angel says, the Lord. What does that mean? Not a Lord. Because in England, we have lords and ladies. Yes, my Lord. Yes, my lady. But this is not that kind of Lord. This is the Lord. The one and only Lord. That's who Jesus is. He's Savior, the Christ, the Lord. Imagine how the shepherds must have felt. The angel says that this will be a sign. You'll find a child lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on whom his favor rests. What does a multitude look like? Have you ever questioned yourself? 
A multitude, according to Revelations 5, is 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands upon thousands. Can you imagine? We think of it being six or seven angels just flying around. Thousands upon thousands. Angels just appeared from nowhere. And started singing praises to God. What were they praising God for? Heaven was rejoicing at the sight of the babe in the manger. Heaven was rejoicing at the sight of the shepherds receiving the news. Heaven was rejoicing that God had become a man. And had revealed himself to broken humanity. What an amazing sight it must have been for the shepherds. So what do the shepherds do? They see all of this. What do they do with that experience? Well, what do we do when we've been told that a child has been born? There's only one thing to do. We go and see the child, right? So the shepherds say, let us go and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. Now, I don't know whether you've ever thought about this. They go off to Bethlehem. Now, here's the amazing thing. They are shepherds. They smell like shepherds. They smell like the sheep that they look after. And they have the audacity to go and see the Savior of the world without taking a shower. Have you ever thought of that? If they were going to the temple, they'd have had a, 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 a shower before they went to the temple. If they were going to see Caesar, they would have got themselves cleaned up. But here is the Savior of the world, and they just rush off to go and see him. And church, I just love that. Because that tells me how good God is to us. That how I smell, how I am in my messed up situation, how I am in my troubled life, can't keep me from seeing the Savior. That God doesn't say, clean yourself up, then come to me. He says, come as you are. That's a word for somebody here today. Come as you are. If you don't quite understand the Christmas story, or the Christian faith, just come as you are to God and ask him to help you. Because the journey to see Jesus doesn't demand perfection. It, de it demands progress. That, that I don't have to get holy overnight, but I've got to do better tomorrow than I did yesterday. But, the, you know, that I may not know every verse of the Bible, but at least I'm reading the Bible now. I may not be able to pray lavish prayers, but at least I'm praying. I'm doing better now than I did back then. That I can come to Jesus just the way I am. So here's the question. If you look at where you are today, this Christmas Eve, in your walk with God, have you made progress from where you were last Christmas Eve to this Christmas Eve? What has changed in your life? How have you become closer to God? What have you done towards that end? Has anything changed? Because the journey to Christ is not one of perfection, it's one of us bettering ourselves each and every day to be more like him in every way. So verse 16, they want to go and see the child. So the Bible says they went with haste. They rushed. This was the first Christmas rush right there. <laughs> and they found Mary and Joseph and child lying in a manger. So what did they do after that? They heard the news, they went. They saw, and then what they do? They went and told people. But after they'd seen in verse 17, they go tell others what the Lord has done and what the Lord has said. Remember, shepherds weren't trusted as witnesses. And it kind of sounds crazy, doesn't it? Also, oh, you, you're telling me you saw a bunch of angels oh, oh, uh, uh, and a baby belonging to a poor couple uh, born in a stable, and that's God's Messiah? Imagine hearing that story. It's like one of those questions your doctors ask when they think you're losing your marbles a little bit. You know, Kesh, do you know what year it is? Do you know who the prime minister is? But isn't it amazing that it didn't stop them? The shepherds didn't care what people thought. The Bible says they told others what the Lord had showed them and said about this child. So let me ask you, after all that God has done for you in your life, how many people have you told about all that he has done for you? After all the prayers that he's answered, all the ways that he's made for you, who have you told about what God has done for you? Because church, when we've seen the Lord, and we know how good God has been to us, 
the ways God has made, the prayers that he's answered, the sins that he's forgiven, and the way that the Lord has changed our lives. That should make you want to open your mouth and tell others about the glory that you have seen. Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What does that mean? It means if God has redeemed you, if God has delivered you from some really messed up situations in your life, then you are called to declare his mighty works. Have you declared his mighty works among the people? Who have you told about all that God has done for you? Verse 18 says, amazingly, remember these were shepherds, but the people who heard the shepherds marveled at what they'd heard. They marveled. They were like, wow. And then the next line says, And Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The while the people were marveling at all this stuff, Mary was pondering. In the original language, the word ponder used here means she didn't just do it once. She just go, oh, wow, that's nice. She kept on pondering over and over again. And she had so much to ponder. An angel had appeared to her told her she was going to have a child, then she had the child. And now she's pondering. Crazy shepherds have turned up to come and see this baby. She pondered these things. And here's my question for us. Have you pondered lately what God has done for you? Have you pondered how we went to that old rugged cross for you? Have you pondered how he died for your sins? Have you pondered that he rose up again after three days and said to you that I'll be with you always? Have you pondered? Have you pondered? Why has he been so good to me? Out of everybody in the world, have you pondered why you? Have you ever pondered why he looked beyond your faults and my faults to our needs? I wonder if you ponder. Note verse 20. The shepherds went back. Went back where? They went back to the fields. They didn't sign a book contract. <laughs> now they'd seen angels and see what these what angels look like. They didn't appear on the Oprah Winfrey show. They went back to the field filled with sheep. They went back. Back to the same old job. Back to the same old life. God didn't change what was on the outside of them. He changed who they were on the inside. And yes, they went back. And yes, they went back to their old life. But in many ways, their lives will never be the same again. Not after what they'd experienced. They found a joy that the world could not give them. They found a wholeness that could not be achieved through counseling. They found acceptance in a world that rejected them. And they found peace that no bank account could produce. What an amazing story this is of God's great love towards us. Where he meets us. How he loves us. In our messed up lives. He shows up. That God speaks to these shepherds in a field filled with sheep. To let us know that whatever you're facing today... He sees you. But he shows up in this field full of sheep droppings. This filthy, dirty field. To let us know that in our messed up situations, he comes to us. He shows up in the darkness. To let us know that in the darkness of our lives, he's very close to us. And after we've seen what God has done for us, he asks us to go and share that good news with somebody else. And lastly, we need to rejoice in all things because we know that Emmanuel, God, is with us. Church, whatever you came to church with on your mind this morning, whether you feel unworthy or whether you feel not good enough, God meets you right where you are. He sees you. He knows you. He knows the situations that you are going through right now. We may not see you. The person next to you doesn't know. But God knows. If he's able to meet shepherds in a messy, messed up situation, 
God is more than able to meet with you right now. Amen.